Okay, welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Ann Bennett. I'm the Executive Director of the Laurel Historical Society here in Maryland. Uh, and I am joined tonight by Diane and John Lill. And uh, they are from the Audubon Naturalist Society in Georgetown University. And we're gonna be talking about cicadas. And this is a little bit of a departure from a history museum, but as you'll discover tonight, there is a lot of history wrapped in with the science, wrapped in with environmental science. Uh, and it's just really just kind of a fun time for the whole family. So just again, as a reminder, we are recording this. We'll put it on our YouTube channel shortly. And what I'll do is I'm just going to pass it over to our guests uh, to get uh, the program started. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My thanks to Diane and John for joining us as well. And I hope you learn some more ways to be a friend to the cicadas. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Anne, and good evening, everyone. My name is Diane Lill. I work with the Audubon Naturalist Society, which is a local uh, Audubon chapter, a nonprofit that serves the DC metro area. And this is my husband, John. He's a professor in the biology department at George Washington University. And we're so excited to tell you all about the cicadas that are about to um, emerge from the ground throughout the DC metro area in the next month or so. And I wanted to start by showing you some pictures that I took um, just in the last few days. Actually, the picture on the left, a friend of mine sent me. She said, are they coming out? Because she was digging in her garden and she unearthed a cicada nymph that was about eight to 12 inches under the soil. And these pictures on the right are emergence holes that I've been seeing in our yard here in Silver Spring just in the last um, two or three days. So we know the cicadas are getting ready. They're digging their emergence holes and they are um, soon going to be with us. And since we have um, hopefully some history buffs in the audience tonight, I wanted to start by reading to you from this really awesome book called Periodical Cicadas by Jean Kritsky. At the end of our talk, I'll, I'll show you how you can order this book. Um, but it has some really wonderful information, the best historical information I've ever found about um, the brood 10 cicadas that we're gonna tell you all about tonight. And this is the very first record that is known, um, that's been written of the brood 10 cicadas. It's from 1715. And this was written by Reverend Andreas Sandel, um, who preached at the Gloria Day Swedish Lutheran Church in Philadelphia. And he wrote this on May 9th, 1715. In this month, some singular flies came out of the ground. The English call them locusts. When they left the ground, holes could be seen everywhere in the roads, especially in the woods. They were then encased in shells out of which they crawled. It seemed most wonderful how being covered with the shell, they were able to burrow their way in the hard ground. When they began to fly, they made a peculiar noise and being found in great multitudes all over the country, their noise made the cowbells inaudible in the woods. They were also destructive, making slits in the bark of the trees where they deposited their worms, which withered the branches. Swine and poultry ate them, but what was more astonishing, when they first appeared, some of the people split them open and ate them, holding them to be of the same kind as those said to have been eaten by John the Baptist. These locusts lasted not longer than up to June 10th and disappeared in the woods. So with that, I am going to turn it over to John to teach you all about these amazing insects that we are about to meet called cicadas. Great, thanks so much, Diane. So um, as Diane mentioned, I'm a professor and currently the chair of the biology department at George Washington University in DC. And I've been spent most of my career um, studying plant insect interactions and the last several years I've uh, been preparing to um, do some original research with a colleague at Georgetown University and some other team members um, on this particular brood 10 emergence. So we're engaged in some some scientific research that's going to that started happening last year and we're going to continue for the next several years. Okay, so let's do some basic background. What is a cicada? Very common question. Uh, so cicadas are insects, and insects, as you may recall, are a group of um, arthropods that have three body regions. They have a head, 
a thorax, and an abdomen. All insects have six legs. They have a pair of antennae. They have a pair of large compound eyes on their head and three smaller um, eye, sort of eye spots on their head as well. And their um, head region also has their mouth parts, which I'll talk about a little bit later. The middle region of their body called the thorax is where all six legs attach and both pairs of wings. And it's really kind of like the muscular part of the insect's body where all the muscles that are used in both locomotion and flight um, occur. And then the third region of the body, the abdomen, is um, very segmented. And you can see there's a lot of little segments on, on the end of it. And contained within the abdomen, there are a variety of internal organs. So this is where insect digestion and the reproductive organs are all found. Okay. Um, and so people often wonder, well, what, what, what are cicadas related to? And so cicadas are in a group of insects known as the true bugs that all have one common feature. They all have really highly modified mouth parts. So rather than having chewing jaws like many insects do, they have these long sucking mouth parts. They're called piercing sucking mouth parts that they use to feed on liquid food of different kinds. So some of these bugs feed, and the, the term bug is appropriately used in this group of insects. Some of them, many of them feed on, on plant juices of some sort, liquid parts of plants, whereas a few others actually feed on um, the fluids of other animals. And so these two pictures you can see here are common insects that are related to cicadas. The top one are, are some yellow aphids that you might see in your garden. And the bottom one is a um, stink bug. So stink bugs are related as well. Um, this large green and black insect here on the right, you can see, is also a cicada. And this is the, the more common um, cicadas that we, we, we generally refer them as, as the dog day cicadas, but they're what we refer to as annual cicada. And there are a bunch of different species of cicadas that occur in our region, somewhere around 17 different species that occur regularly. Okay, so, and, but the periodical cicadas are the most, the ones we're gonna be focusing on today. And they're really different from the dog day cicadas in a couple different ways, which I'll talk about in a minute. But we're really excited because of course, these are the stars of the show that are gonna be occur occurring this year. And these cicadas in our region, we refer to them as brood 10. Sometimes you'll hear referred to as brood X, but the X is just a Roman numeral for 10. Okay, so how are cicadas different, the periodical cicadas that are coming out this year, how are they different from the more common annual cicadas that we see every year? So first of all, you can see their colors are different, right? So the periodical cicadas have, all have sort of blackish bodies with bright red eyes and orange um, veins in their wings, whereas the dog day cicadas, the more common ones, are mostly green and black. Uh, periodical cicadas, the, the developing nymphs that are underground take a really long time to develop, either 13 or 17 years to complete development underground. Whereas the dog day cicadas are much quicker and can complete their development in usually around an average of about four years to develop. The periodical cicadas also emerge synchronously, and this is a really key part of their bi biology that makes them so amazing and such a wonder, is that they they have really a good timing. So they come out all at once in, in the spring. Um, and the dog day cicadas don't do that. They're staggered. They're not found in the spring. So they don't overlap with the periodical cicadas at all. You won't find them together. But later in the summer is when you find the, the annual cicadas or the dog day cicadas occurring. And they just kind of come out gradually over the summer. They're most common around here in like July and August. They're really hot days of summer. Um, and then, yeah. And so then their sheer numbers is what distinguishes them. So the periodical cicadas, like I said, they, because they emerge synchronously, they also emerge in huge numbers, which are just really overwhelming. And that's part of their biology as well. And the dog day cicadas just kind of trickle up and they're never found in very large numbers. Okay, so you, you may hear um, people refer to periodical cicadas as locusts. And it's really, this is an interesting historical um, artifact. So, 
early on when the colonists arrived in the New World and experienced the cicadas for the first time, they just the sheer numbers of these insects, they confused them with migratory locusts, which were known from Europe and from parts of um, North Africa. And um, swarms of locusts are very biblical, right? So they, they're, they're sort of a bad omen and they consume huge amounts of crops. So they can be really devastating to people. So the, the colonists confused them with locusts and, and that name stuck. And so it's been passed down through many generations up until this day. So let's compare them and see how they're different though. So as I mentioned before, periodical cicadas are part of a group of insects known as true bugs. Um, whereas locusts are a type of grasshopper. So very different, a totally different order of insects. Um, periodical cicadas have two pairs of clear membranous wings, as you can see in this picture, whereas the wings of grasshoppers are actually all folded up underneath these leathery outer wings. So you, you don't even, they don't even appear to have wings when you see them walking around, but they do. Um, periodical cicadas, as I mentioned before, have highly modified mouth parts for feeding on plant sap, liquid parts of plants, whereas grasshoppers have more traditional insect mouth parts. They're mandibles for chewing and feeding on leaves and above ground plant tissues. Periodical cicadas do not feed on crops at all, so they're, not, they're no danger to anybody's agriculture, whereas um, grasshoppers are a pretty significant agricultural pest and can, can be quite destructive. Okay, so a big question about periodical cicadas is where are they found? And this is a really great map that was produced by the US um, DA Forest Service that maps the locations of periodical cicadas in North America. And what you can see is that they're pretty much confined to the eastern part of the United States. So on this map, um, you, it's divided and color coded by what's known as the broods of periodical cicadas. And a brood is a group of cicadas in a geographical region that is all synchronously timed to a, on a particular cycle. Okay, so if you look carefully at the key that they number from brood one all the way up to brood um, 23. So there's a lot of different broods. There's actually 12 existing right now that we know that there are 12 broods of 17 year cicadas and three broods of the 13 year cicadas. And they're found in different places. And so um, and, and they emerge in different years. So in men, most years, there's a brood emerging somewhere in the Eastern United States. So if we focus on our brood, brood 10, which you can see here in, in white, um, on the key, it lists the next emergence here for each of the broods. And of course, 2021 is highlighted right there. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit. A more specific question, well, exactly where are the brood 10 cicadas? So here's a close-up map of our area showing Maryland, DC, and Northern Virginia and the different counties. All of the counties that are labeled in purple um, were previously recorded as having brood 10 periodical cicadas emerging in 2004. So you can see it's actually pretty specific. So almost all of Maryland, except for the Eastern Shore, which is kind of interesting, um, and then in Virginia, it's mostly just the counties that border the Potomac River. So just the northernmost counties in Virginia are part of brood 10. You don't have to go very far south in Virginia and then you encounter other broods actually. It's kind of interesting. But specifically in each of those, just because a county has cicadas, it doesn't mean that every single square inch of that county has periodical cicadas. They're kind of patchy wherever, you, wherever they're found. They can be incredibly dense in one neighborhood and then hardly any in the next neighborhood over. So we're, ecologists are we're interested in what determines the distribution of the cicadas. So in thinking about this and just looking at a set of these little scenes here, where, where do you think you might see um, periodical cicadas? So we, we like to ask this question of where we think we might be able to find them. Um, and so if you guessed the middle picture, then you were right, right? So we only find periodical cicadas where there are trees, right? So this is really important for some of the history and what we refer to as the biogeography of, of the cicadas is they're not compatible with forest destruction and land conversion. So much of the Eastern forest, as you know, um, since humans, since um, colonists came to the new world has been converted into agriculture and, um, 
so like the upper right hand um, picture, as well as into grassland habitats for ranching and things like that. And those areas that have long been in cultivation are unlikely to have any periodical cicadas, except maybe in the little woodlots that are remain around surrounding agricultural fields. Um, similarly, highly developed areas, especially pavement, is incompatible with periodical cicadas who live underground and must burrow up and so cannot do so in those areas. And then we have a big question mark for the suburbs. And so the suburbs are really funny. So some suburbs um, that were developed in such a way that retained large mature trees when they built the housing developments have always had periodical cicadas and probably always were, will. And so where we live in Silver Spring is a good example. It's incredibly dense for a brood 10 periodical cicadas. But other places that clear cutted the forest in order to build the subdivisions and then just planted small trees, depending on when that happened, they may be much, much less likely to have broods of periodical cicadas emerging there. Okay, so it turns out that within this brood of synchronously emerging cicadas, they're all going to come out this May in our region, there are three different species contained within that brood. And that's true of most of the 17 year broods of cicadas. They have two to three different species that co-occur and are synchronized in their life cycles. Um, and so the three different species, uh, they're all in the same genus, Magis cicada. And that word magic refers to magis, which means numerous or many. It also is sort of magical, what them coming out of, you know, apparently out of nowhere to appear. And probably the most common one we're going to find around here is Magis cicada septendecim. So that's a Latin term for 17. And that's the largest species. And you can tell the different species by turning them over and looking at their abdom abdominal segments. So we talked about the abdomen, the third body region of the insect. And septendecim has really broad orange stripes um, on the abdominal segments. Uh, the smallest one is Magis cicada Cassini, and Cassini is, the abdomen is almost all entirely black, and they're a little bit smaller, or quite a bit smaller actually than septum decim. And then all, another one related to Cassini is septum decula, another way of saying 17. Uh, they're a little bit bigger than Cassini, but they, they have sort of a mix of black and orange, very thin orange bands. So that one is the least common. Okay, so I'm just going to go over a little bit about the basic life cycle of the cicada. So um, one of our team members um, is a really talented artist and she's also an entomologist and she painted all the artwork here in this nice little diagram. So we're going to start in the lower left hand corner um, underground, which is where exactly where the periodical cicada nymphs are right at this moment. So they're fully developed living underground right there, getting ready to, and they've, they're actually digging their tunnels right now, as we saw in our yard this morning. And so they're digging their tunnels, and then in May, they're going to finally emerge, and they're going to crawl out of the soil, and the first thing they're going to do, it's going to happen at night, and they're going to crawl onto a tree in order to um, do their very last molt to adulthood, and I'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute. So then once they'll take, that evening they will molt into the adult, um, the adults will kind of settle for a little while, they'll harden up for a couple of days, and then they'll fly off to the trees where the, all the excitement, the big show is going to begin to happen, where males will begin to call, um, they'll get together and um, attract females for mating. Once mating has happened, then the, the males are basically done then, and the females will fly off and to look for overposition sites, so they're going to look for good places to lay their eggs to start the next generation. And soon after that, um, by mid-June or so, the whole show is over. The cicadas will mostly die. The adults are very short-lived. And then everybody's going to forget about them. But hidden in the trees, their eggs are going to be developing all summer. And in the late summer, usually around early August or so, the eggs will start hatching. And the tiny, tiny, like small ant-sized nymphs will then jump from the branches, um, lightly landing on the soil and where they will quickly burrow in to begin to feed on tree roots and spend, they'll spend the, where they will spend the next 17 years developing, not to be seen again until 2038. Okay, so just a little bit about their life cycle. As I mentioned, they have three life stages. Um, they start out as eggs, if those will hatch into the nymphs, which will, that's the growing stage where they will be feeding underground. And um, they need to molt, so they have to, in order to grow bigger, because insects have their, their skeleton on the outside, known as an exoskeleton, they have to molt 
every time that they want to get bigger. So they have to shed their skin and grow a new one. And they do all of those molts except for the last one underground. So out of sight, nobody ever really sees them. And, and then finally, they're going to come out as adults. And this, this life cycle is, a, is shared by a bunch of different insect groups. They're a little bit more primitive. And it's known as incomplete metamorphosis. And we say that because when the, the last insect nymph crawls up, it looks pretty much like the adult, except its wings are not expanded. And um, it doesn't have its, um, the, their reproductive organs are not completely developed. But other than that, they look pretty much like the adults. So there's not such a dramatic change from the last insar nymph to the adult. They're about the same size and everything, okay? And this is very different from the more typical insect life cycle that we teach to kids, you know, in the counties around here all the time as part of their science units, um, where there's actually four stages, an egg, which hatches into a larva, and so a different name than a nymph, and that's the equivalent, that's the growing stage, the feeding stage of, of things like butterflies and moths. And the larva um, is it designed specifically just for feeding. It will molt several times as well, and then turns into a, a third stage known as the pupa stage, which the in cicadas and other insects don't have. And that's where metamorphosis really occurs, where there's a dramatic change where the larva turns into the adult. The mouth parts change, the whole body changes, they get wings. And so there's a very dramatic transformation. So we refer to this as complete metamorphosis. So that's how it differs. Okay, so the cicada life cycle I just described briefly. Um, if we want to put it in a temporal context, this, this little wheel that we created here um, indicates the total generation time of a single generation of cicadas, which is, again, about 17 years. And so what you can see is we've divided the, the um, total time into three different colors. So we have orange for the nymph stage, um, blue for the adult stage, and red for the egg stage. And what we tried to make it more or less proportional. What you can see is that periodical cicadas basically spend 99% of their entire life as nymphs, right? So they're very short-lived as eggs and even more short-lived as adults. So even though the adults are the big show, they're just a tiny little blip in the life cycle of these insects. Okay, a little bit about their feeding. I mentioned that they have these really odd mouth parts. So this is a, an old diagram from 1898 of the close-up of the modified stylets, um, or sometimes they refer to as the beak of these type of insects. That's again, it's this piercing sucking mouth parts where they basically plug into the plumbing of a plant. And all the insects that have this kind of mouth parts, they feed on one of two different types of tissues in a plant. So there's two types of conductive tissues in, in a plant. There's xylem and phloem. And xylem is the tissue that brings water and nutrients from the soil up into the plant, into the leaves. And phloem um, is where the sugars that are produced in the leaves and stems are then shunted around to feed the cells and the rest of the plant. So they're kind of doing different things. So aphids, for example, feed on phloem, which is very sugary rich. So the cicadas are feeding on the xylem. And by feeding on the xylem of the roots, they're basically acting like roots themselves. They're getting the same nutrition that the plant is deriving right from the soil, which is really poor nutrition. It's mostly water and a little bit of nutrients. And that's part of the reason probably that cicadas require so much time to complete their development is they have a really poor overall nutritious diet. But in order to supplement their nutrition and, and grow as well as they do, um, most sucking insects have evolved a specialized relationship with bacteria that they have in their guts that are called endosymbionts. So there's specialized bacteria that live within their guts and do things for the insects. In this case, they have, there's two species with the periodical cicadas that manufacture many of the amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins that all animals need in order to, to grow. And these bacteria then are really important because they produce much of the nutrients that the insect needs in order to grow. And they're so important that the female cicadas, when they lay their eggs, they actually have a specialized way of ensuring that a little bit of those gut bacteria are included, inserted into each egg that she lays so that her offspring are inoculated with those same bacteria that she has. We call that vertical transmission from mother to offspring. 
Okay, so this is where they are now. This shows the last instar nymph just getting ready. They're down, they're about 12 to 18 inches below the soil surface in their last little chamber. It's like a little, a little cave. They're, they all live alone underneath in the ground. So ever since they got to the, the soil, they've been basically living on their entire life solitarily, feeding on a root. <laughs> they move around a little bit in the soil. So they probably move from one place to another as they find better feeding locations. But they basically, for the last year, they've been in this little chamber. They're done developing right now. So they're getting ready to come out. They're fully grown. And you can see in the central picture, you can see they have bright red eyes. So their eyes have changed color. They were white for the first 16 years. As they head into their 17th year, they turn red. You can also see the little folded up wing buds that are going to be where the wings are going to, going to expand from. So they look pretty much like the adults. And so then what's going to be happening starting sometime in May when the soil gets warm, a little bit warmer and the days get a little bit longer, there's going to be some cue that we don't quite fully understand, but it's a combination of temperature and light that's going to tell all these cicadas that have built their tunnels that, okay, now it's time to come up and up they're going to come, right? And so we're starting to see the holes now because they're preparing them. Um, and some of them just look like holes in the soil and they're about the size of a I don't know, maybe a dime or something, yeah, in the soil. And some of them, if it's sandy, um, that you might see that they actually, as they build their exit holes, they build a little tower called a turret um, out of soil or mud, um, which is kind of interesting. Some of them do that. Okay, and then um, what's gonna happen is soon, when they do emerge, and I mentioned this always happens at night, so you wanna, uh, on a warm night in May, especially after rain, there's gonna be some cue and they're gonna start coming up. And these last insert nymphs are gonna crawl a couple feet off the ground, usually on vegetation, but on fences, they like fences, they'll, they'll climb, climb on pretty much anything. And they'll climb a couple feet up and then they're gonna pause for a little bit and they're going to do their last molt, which is an interesting show. So you can see on the left-hand picture, an uh, adult cicada that has just emerged from its last instar nymphal case the exoskeleton that we refer to as a shell sometimes. And you can see it does this crazy back bend where it pulls out, it splits on its back, and then it pulls its body out um, and does this big back bend and, until it sits there for a little, it takes about an hour, and then it will just crawl on top of its shell and then begin pumping up its wings. So its wings, you can see it in real time. It takes just about an hour for them to completely fill their wings with hemolymph. So their wings have vessels and they, their blood is called hemolymph and they pump it up and they're really soft and white you can see with just their bright red eyes they're really interesting colored when they first come out but by morning they'll like I mentioned before they'll harden and so once these adults are out they've left behind um, their nymphal cases the the shells you can see on vegetation and they're really fun to kind of collect so I'm going to um, so last uh, emergence in 2004 um, we collected a bunch of um, cicada shells uh, that we've kept in addition. They've been, they look just like, pretty much like they did in 2004. And these cicada, these, the shells of these cicadas, these cicadas themselves were born in 1987. So the, these shells are now 34 years old, actually. I mean, the insect was born 34 years ago. Um, yeah. And so the, um, D Diane so has we blew up one of these with a microscope and this is what it looks like. Yeah, this is what one of the nymph nymphal shells that you could find in the tree looks like under a microscope. And we're trying to do this to show to the students when we do this presentation. You can see the split in the back of the thorax where the adult pulled out of, of its shell, but you can also see a lot of other detail. You can see where the wing buds were, you can see the, all their legs and the eyes and the antennae. And from the side, Diane got this great image of what one of the, the shells looks like. And you can see pretty much everything, especially I wanna highlight the front um, tarsi. So the front legs and have these special, in, especially in the last instar, are these highly modified um, front legs that are specifically for digging. So they're really good at excavating soil. And you can really see that with the sharp claws and the muscles that are involved there. You can also see the wing buds um, well on here as well. Yeah, you can see the wing buds here too. Okay, 
So a little bit about um, once, they're, once they're done, they molted to the adults, then it's all about reproduction, right? So courtship and mating. And um, the thing that everybody knows about periodical cicadas is they're loud, they're really, really loud, right? One of the loudest noises made by an individual insect anywhere in the world. So uh, upwards of 80 plus decibels an individual uh, male cicada can make. And the noise that they make is all the boys, right? So all the male cicadas are the ones making the, doing the noise. And the, the, we, the way they do this, the way they make their noise has been studied. So they, the males on their abdomen, they have a specialized pair of membranes. It's kind of whitish, it's distinct in color and they're called timbals. And they're these rigid sort of flexible but rigid membranes that they can use mus muscles to vibrate several hundred times a second. And that vibrate, vibrating membrane is what causes the male song. And because it's in their abdomen and male, um, adult male cicadas, essentially they're just geared for reproduction. Most of their abdomen is actually hollow and it seems to act like an echo chamber that, that helps um, distribute the sound e even more. Um, you can sex them if you look at their tips of their abdomen. So the, male, the males have more of a blunt tipped abdomen. The females have an ovipositor. It's in, sort of in a sheath, but they have a long tube, tubular structure that they use in order to lay eggs that's um, more pointy. The males are usually a little bit smaller than the females too. So let's listen to the timbles. Yep. You can see the white, that's the tube. You can see it vibrating in this little video. So this is an alarm call because he's not too happy. <laughs> okay, so that's what a, a cicada sounds like. So, um, and they use, of course, that song in order to attract females. And what's kind of exciting about that is um, they, the males in order to, to effectively reproduce, they get together in groups of males known as a chorus, usually in an individual tree, all of one species, and they all do their songs together. And that attracts a group of suitors, a, a bunch of females that might be interested. And if they find a male song they like, they may, it usually takes a couple of hours or so. Um, you find them joined at the abdomens. Um, and once they're fertilized, once the females are fertilized, the males fly off to try to get another mating. The females only mate once, whereas the males mate several different times. Um, once the female is mated, then she's all about um, reproducing. So she's, it's her job to then seek out and lay the next generation of cicadas. So in this lovely diagram, the upper left-hand corner, it's actually a painting. You can see it's a female and you can see her ovipositor um, you know, the arrow I can point it out. Here's your ovipositor that's stuck into, made a slit in the, the stem of this woody plant, which is what the females do. So the really only destructive thing that, that cicadas do is all done by the females when they're laying eggs. So they, they cut a slit, a vertical slit in the stem of small woody twigs that are usually about the diameter of a pencil. So the terminal ends of small branchlets um, on woody plants, and they're not too picky. They use a lot of different plant um, species. So if you have really small plants that um, you're worried about, then you might put some netting over them to protect them. So she'll, she'll poke holes in multiple places and lay little batches of about 20 eggs until she's laid somewhere between two and 400 eggs. And then they're going to sit there for, um, in, for four to six weeks until they finish developing. And then the little first insect nymphs, as I said, they'll drop to the ground. But all summer long, later and into the fall, we'll see these, this um, scene in the right-hand picture where there's all these dead leaves or terminal branches of where these egg nests, nests have been laid. And it's called flagging. So who eats cicadas? Pretty much anything that can eat cicadas will. They're really nutritious. So lots of birds, lots of uh, mammals, including squirrels, which aren't normally very insectivorous. They'll just gorge themselves on cicadas, possums. People's pets will eat them. Fish have been known to eat them. Foxes, raccoons, you name it. Also, people eat cicadas. Um, there's a lot of uh, interest in this. There's a couple different cookbooks that are around. 
We know from historical records that uh, Native Americans also ate cicadas, both as kind of a delicacy, as well as a survival food. So Native Americans were well aware that during starvation periods, they could always dig up cicadas um, in any place and find enough that they could put together a meal. So there's lots of different ways to prepare them. Be prepared to see them on the menu at some fine restaurants in DC and Georgetown. Okay, why are there so many? This is a really important question that a lot of people ask. Why are they in such large numbers? The large numbers is the key to their survival. So unlike a lot of insects that have all kinds of defenses, hairs, spines, stingers, poisons of all kinds, periodical cicadas are basically completely defenseless. The, all they can do is fly a little bit and they're not even that good at that and buzz, they make some noise, but that's about it. So anything that can eat them will. So the way that they, the key to their long-term survival has been to just overwhelm their predators by occurring synchronously in such large numbers that they completely satiate all the possible predators that might be interested in eating them. So that's an, a, a technique known as predator satiation. And that's the way we, the reason why we think there's so many. Okay, a lot of people wonder how they tell time. And this is still a little bit of a mystery, but we're beginning to understand it. So what we know is that because they're underground, they don't have access to the same temperature and light cues of the seasons that, that organisms above ground would. So it's been a little bit of a mystery. But because they're plugged in pretty much all the time to the, the plant, they're able to derive plant-based cues about the seasonal changes that happen every time the plant deciduous trees flush a new set of leaves, there's a different chemical composition and flow rate of the xylem sap that they're feeding on. So because that happens predictably every spring and then shuts down in the fall, we're pretty sure that they're using those seasonal cues in order to keep to um, count. That's what they're using to count. And we know that specifically because some scientists did a little experiment where they removed the leaves of, of tree um, part early in the season, forcing the plant to shut down and then flush a new set of leaves, which is what defoliated plants will do. And sure enough, the cicadas that they did that to counted an extra year and came out a year early. So they, they're pretty sure that they're using the plant as a way to tell time. What they don't know is how they remember, how they keep track of how many time, years have passed. And they're not putting little marks on the walls of their caves. So we, that's still a bit of a mystery, but we think it has a genetic or epigenetic mechanism that has to do yeah, with some complicated biochemistry. Um, and then I mentioned that there are that the lots of things eat them, but those are all generalist predators. The only specialized enemy of the cicadas is this is bizarre fungus known as Mazospora cicadina. And it's a specialized fungus that is in a resting spore in the soil for all the years that the cicadas are developing underground doing nothing. Then right in a couple of weeks when these guys start emerging, those spores are gonna germinate and be picked up by the nymphs as they emerge from the soil and infect them. The spores um, grow and multiply in their abdomens of the cicadas which as you remember, all the muscles are in, are in the um, thorax. So this actually doesn't harm the cicadas much. They're still active and flying around and they'll still attempt to mate and do all their normal reproductive behaviors, which actually just serves to transmit the spores. So basically the spores have sort of taken over the bodies of the cicadas in order to ensure their own reproduction. One really bizarre thing about the fungus is that um, males that are infected with this fungus instead of calling like normal males, they'll sometimes respond to other males and use the female response that, insinu that it suggests that she's interested in mating, causing males to try to mate with each other, which just serves to transmit the spores between males. So it's another clever sort of sexual mimicry that the cicadas use. Okay, then what happens to dead cicadas? So what we know is um, cicadas, once they die, and there's gonna be a lot of dead ones, you'll smell them. They have a very characteristic smell when they're decaying. A lot of scavengers will just eat dead cicadas of different sorts. And then there's a lot of bacteria and fungi that will break it down, causing this big pulse of nutrients that go back into the soil to feed the very trees that the next generation of cicadas is gonna use as its host plant. So it's sort of the cir full circle of life. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Diane to tell you a little bit more um, about um, some of the educational activities uh, that we've developed associated with this. So. Yes, 
I'm sorry, John and Diane, can I break in? Because we've got some great questions for John, and I just want to say, do you want to answer them now, or do you want to wait until Diane is done with her part? What do you think? I don't care. Um, let, let's do it at the end. I think we can, because there might be a bunch of questions at the end. Okay, so, that's yeah. perfect. All right, we got a really active audience here. So, all right, Diane, take it away. Thank you. I just wanted to recognize our other partners on this project, Martha Weiss, who's a professor in the biology department at Georgetown University, and Zoe Getman Pickering, who is a postdoc with, with my husband, and she did all of the amazing artwork on our project. So we have everything on this website, friendtocicadas.org, and we felt like there, um, this is such an amazing opportunity to teach children not to be afraid of insects and to teach them about the amazing wonders of nature and to appreciate nature. So that was our goal with um, the Friend to Cicadas materials. And we're having a haiku contest. And we also have this digital notebook um, that students, teachers can download a writable PDF directly from the website. You know, since we're still in this hybrid um, learning situation. And these are just a couple of pages that I pulled out to show you that we've incorporated history into the digital notebook. We have multiple subject areas. We have math, science, music, history, and we have a really cool cicada timeline. We have some amazing writings from Benjamin Banneker who um, reflected on the cicadas. So we hope you'll check that out, especially if you have children in your life who might be interested in this. And the book that I read from at the beginning, I did want to mention, this is really great if you're interested in the history and you want to look back at all the historical records we have of the brood 10 cicadas. Um, you can get it on Amazon, but it's also, if you wanted to support Audubon Naturalist Society, you can shop online at our Audubon Naturalist shop and we are carrying the book there. You would have to go to anshome.org and then when you get to the naturalist shop page, click on the shop online button. So um, with that, we did want to, while you're thinking of all your questions and putting them in the chat, I wanted to play this video that just shows you in beautiful, beautiful um, videography, everything that John just explained about the cicadas. And then we will answer questions after this.
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing our screen so that um, John can take questions. Hey, yes, let me, while I figure out how to get my video back up, I'm going to ask John the first question. Uh, so we had a location question. Uh, two of our participants wanted to know, will they also be emerging both in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia and also what about New York City uh, and New York State? So yeah, so they're definitely going to be in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia, but not far into West Virginia. So that, there's another brood that's in part of it, but the Eastern Panhandle, Harper's Ferry and all that, it's going to definitely be um, brood 10. New York historically had a little bit of brood 10, especially out on Long Island, but I think the long-term development in agriculture that's occurred there over a long time has caused it to go mostly locally extinct. So it's unclear what, whether, you know, they probably were in what would become New York City once upon a time, but they're not really found in New York City proper anymore. But uh, there are tiny bits of it that apparently are still in very specific locations on Long Island that the uh, team is going to be documenting this year exactly where they are. Okay, great. Uh, and then Jody had a question about uh, going back to their appearance. So she thought that the wings and uh, kind of look upside down. And if you look at them, they kind of look like they, you know, they might not fly like we're used to seeing other insects or butterflies fly. Uh, so she wanted to know, is there a reason for it? Is that why they kind of uh, fly differently or more clumsy than other insects? No, I mean, they're, they're not great flyers for sure. I think they're, you know, they, they're pretty good at crawling, but they, they can fly decently well, and the females will to, to find new locations. But their, their wings, like a lot of insects, they're held kind of roof-like over their body. So they have two sets of wings held back and kind of like, like a roof over their body. So that's why it looks, it's different from a butterfly and a lot of butterflies, instead of having them roof-like, they hold them together straight up over their body. So really the butterflies are more the exception. The cicadas are more typical of a lot of insects actually, so. That's great, that's great. And so I know you said that they can be eaten, humans can eat them and it's okay. So if yep. you catch your dog or your cat or you know <laughs> your, your pets playing with them or eating them, that, that's okay. Yes, so they will definitely. They're a delicate, I mean, dogs like them. And the pr only problem is that they're full of chitin. So the protein, the, the hard shell of the exoskeleton is this pretty tough chitinous, you know, um, substance that if they eat too many of them, it can cause them some digestive distress. So, um, so a lot of dogs that like, it's probably not a good idea to let your dog just go hog wild and eat as many cicadas as they want, or you might be at the vet. <laughs> so the vets know this is coming and they're probably getting ready as we speak, you know, to handle the, this, but, um, yeah, yeah, our, our vet actually recommended using a muzzle, um, soft. a soft muzzle to prevent them when you're out walking, if you don't want your dogs to eat too many cicadas. We have beagles and they'll eat anything and they're gonna love to eat these things. <laughs> We're getting ready for that. That's gonna be some drama, I'm sure, so. Uh, so it sounds like we also have quite a few uh, horticulturists, uh, gardeners uh, in our group tonight. So there were quite a few questions about uh, possible damage from the cicadas, especially on young trees. Are there any concerns about uh, trees? A couple of our participants that they've planted within one to uh, you know four years ago. Any even on traditional flowers uh, and, and trees in our yards. Yeah, so they won't. Uh, herbaceous plants are not used by cicadas at all. So it's only woody things. So it's going to be small trees and shrubs that they might damage with their oviposition scars, just the way the females lay the eggs. And most plants can handle this. So mature trees, you know, even though you'll see a lot of flagging, a lot of dead leaves from those branches, it's sort of a natural pruning process and the, the trees survive it just fine for the most part, but really small plants. Some people, it, they advise basically not to plant trees this spring, right? If you can just wait a couple weeks until after the cicadas are done, then plant them, you'll be good to go. Um, so that's what people generally say. And you can sort of use some netting to temporarily cover your trees in to prevent the cicadas from laying eggs in them. So. Okay, good. All right. So it sounds like most of our, our you know, kind of uh, gardens and herbs will, will be safe, but yeah. Totally fine. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and good. Someone said something about if they come out early, if they pr 
emerge early. So if people dig them up, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure what's going to happen, but you can put them back in the soil and they'll probably still emerge if you accidentally dig them up. Yeah. Okay, and uh, kind of a related question. You had talked about you're not quite sure what happens in suburban places or uh, in developed places. Uh, so if they have been paved over in the last 17 years since they, exactly. they went underground, do they, are they stuck? Do they kind of move around? So how do they get out? Yeah, so um, some of our neighbors have been posting pictures of some flagstones that they lifted up in their yard and they could see horizontal tunnels. Basically some tried to come up and hit the stone <laughs> and then went sideways. So my guess is from his video, from his picture from this morning, that they can do that. They're pretty good diggers. So they'll go around things as much as they can, but I'm sure there's gonna be some that are gonna be permanently entombed by uh, you know, a paved yard or something yeah. along those, yard, okay. those lines, so. And so should we expect uh, their emergence in one night or is this over several nights, several weeks, how? how? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it, it's pretty concentrated. So it's usually a, a couple of weeks probably from the very first one till the last one comes out, but it's concentrated usually within a period of about 10 days, the vast majority of them are gonna come out. So at one study in Kansas found that 90% of them came out within nine day period or something okay. like that. So it's, it's pretty, when, when it's, once it gets going, it's gonna ramp up and then it's gonna be a couple nights of, wow, you know, just so many coming out. Uh, I remember in 2004, walking outside and having the impression that there was water flowing down our street. And I realized they were just cicada nymphs crawling in street by the thousands and thousands of them. So it really is, you know, pretty in, in a good location, like in some of the suburbs. So the older suburbs like Tacoma Park and probably Laurel, actually, uh, downtown Laurel, I can imagine, where there's old trees, you know, um, that's the kind of places that they're going to be, have rich populations where they've had long old trees. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so the question, uh, it, we can't really have an average or so per acre in, in kind of the Baltimore DC corridor because it, it really varies. So like you said, if there's old trees, more historic yeah, right. towns and neighborhoods, uh, like we have in Laurel, Montgomery, Main Street, uh, we'll probably get more. But like you said, you know, open fields, there wouldn't be anything in, in the city itself, there really wouldn't be much expected. Yeah, so we're going to be measuring densities. So that's one of the things scientists are really interested in is what, what causes them to be so patchy. Um, but when people have measured them, some of the highest densities ever recorded for any of the, you know, any of the 15 broods of cicadas have been along the Potomac River. So the densities there have been estimated upwards of three and a half million cicadas per acre. So it's really staggering. So total emergence for brood 10 is estimated to be somewhere around a trillion cicadas. So across 15 states. So it truly is one of the largest insect emergences recorded anywhere in, in the world. And brood 10 is one of the biggest. So, um, okay. but yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so kind of like you said, like that's their, their strength of, of survival is really just their sheer numbers. Sheer numbers. Yep. Right, so we, we had a couple of questions kind of going toward that. They said, uh, have they been more endangered lately because of habitat loss, because of more development, and even in the last 17 years? That's a really good question. So we haven't done a very good job of documenting either densities or even the geography, uh, exact geography. So there's a new um, team from the University of Connecticut and some um, colleagues at St. Joseph's University that have an app where they're tracking the emergences, where they're asking people to volunteer. So it's, it's called Cicada Safari, and it's an app that anybody can download on their phone. And it just lets you take a picture and it automatically uploads the, ge the geo references with the location of where you saw the cicadas. And then they'll sort of ground truth that. And they're using that to really um, very finely map the, the edges of the distribution of all the broods. So this, this app has been going for a while now, I think. Um, it wasn't out in, we didn't even have cell phones in 2004, you know, I mean, Facebook just started in 2004. That was the last emergence. So a lot's happened, but I think there's, there's um, the technology is going to allow us to get a much more accurate um, picture of exactly, you know, where, where they're coming out.
Okay, so in addition to uh, the Cicada Safari, is there any type of um, website that kind of tracks them that kind of has like an almost like a, an alert system like this, you know, this week be on the lookout? Is that something they can get from your website? Um, we're going to be trying to do some live streaming of the actual emergence event happening, but you just need to go outside and look in your yard. You don't really need to. I, I would encourage you not to go on your computer. Go outside and look at this event because it's really amazing to see. And you can just go out in the evening and just watch it. It's a nighttime thing. Bring your flashlight or your headlamp. Bring your grandmother and your four-year-old. Maybe not your dog, but everybody else. <laughs> and, and watch the event happening. I think it's just fascinating for people to see it happening right in your backyard or in a nearby park or wherever, so. Absolutely, uh, so we had a couple questions, again, going back to the, the predators. You had said that really they don't have many natural predators, uh, but uh, there was a question about uh, wasps or bees actually called cicada killers. Is that That's right. accurate? Yeah, so there's a uh, one of our one of our largest um, native wasp species um, is, a, is the common name is cicada killer, and they do they the females sting and paralyze adult cicadas, and then bury them underground where they lay their eggs on them, so they have fresh meat basically to lay their developing wasp larvae in, in little underground burrows. But the cicada killers only feed on the annual cicadas, so they're not out yet. They're, they, don't, they won't come out until the summer after the cicadas are done. So a lot of people refer to them and think that they're involved with the periodical cicadas, but they only feed on the annual cicada. But that's okay. a, really, it's a really good question. Okay, good. Uh, and kind of similar, there, there have been things that we've seen on Facebook especially, uh, and one of them has been warning us about uh, snakes and particularly copperheads, that they like the cicadas. Is this the same thing that we should be worried about or is this kind of... You know, uh, yeah, I saw that too. I just saw that on Facebook. Um, I think it's interesting that snakes will, I mean, just like a lot of things, anything can feed on these these insects. So Rats are more of a concern to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're... We do know that a lot of the generalist predators that will take advantage of this bounty, you know, of cicada prey are going to um, exhibit what we refer to as a numerical response. So that means that they're going to reproduce much better this year than they have in years prior because of all this extra food. So songbirds in particular, there's well-documented patterns of increased nestling survival and reproduction in cicada emergence years all around the eastern U.S. because different broods are coming out different times so people have studied it in all different kind of places so not all bird species eat cicadas but the ones that do are going to do better and they're going to be more of those birds next year and so my guess is that for all these other things including rodents so especially rats um, we had a pretty much big explosion of rats the couple of years after the cicada emergence in the suburbs in silver spring that i'm sure was related to, to that right. phenomenon yeah. so um who know, but you know Pete, the, the interesting thing is very few people have studied the ecological impacts of the cicada emergence on all these other things and so that's one of the, the big goals of our own research program is we're trying to document this sort of cascade of indirect effects that the emergence propagates in the ecological communities in surrounding forests, so. Great, um, just a few more questions to wrap up. They kind of, again, go back to locations and where can we expect them? So is this something we're gonna be seeing further east in Maryland, like Eastern Shore? Um, I know, you know, they're kind of, you know, more sandy soil, less trees out there, but is that something where we can expect them further east? Yeah, no, they, they drop out um, on the Eastern Shore. So okay. we think, according to some old maps, they used to occur there, but they've been probably gone for a while. So they're not recorded for any of the, uh, if you go across the Bay Bridge, you're not going to find cicadas, essentially. You have to go all the way north to like Cecil County mm -hmm. um, in the far northeast part yeah. of the state to find them, but pretty much the Eastern Shore is, is not going to have them. I mean, even even Anne Arundel County is kind of the dividing line, apparently, because they're basically not very common in Annapolis and east of there. And I think it's probably because that land mostly had been farmed for a really long time. And so, and it also gets to be more Eastern shore floodplain. Yeah, kind of, right. you know, the soil's not quite right for the, for them or the trees or it gets flooded or something, but um, yeah, there are cutoff points there. Okay. 
And is this something that's really just a phenomenon in the kind of the eastern part of the United States? Are they found on other continents? Uh, because the music we saw was, um, we heard was Maori. Are oh, yeah. They in New Zealand too, or? No, they're not in New Zealand. So there are a lot of cicadas. The, probably the center for diversity of cicadas is Australia. Actually, there's lots of different species. They don't have periodical cicadas in Australia mm -hmm. or New Zealand. And that video was the Brood 10. Yeah, that was our cicadas. It was just their music upside to it for some reason. <laughs> that was the YouTube version. Yeah, just a YouTube version that we could download. But the um, but it, that's a really good question. So for a long time, it was thought that the only periodical cicadas were in North America. But now they've since discovered, and there are seven different species in North America, but now they've discovered there are two additional cicada species that are also periodical that occur on either four or eight year cycles. So it's kind of weird. Um, one of them is in India um, and the other is in um, Fiji. Fiji, yeah, in the, in the Pacific. Um, and they're totally different unrelated species, but they've evolved the periodicity similar to these, our periodical cicadas, but not quite the numbers. Right, right. Okay. Um, well, John, just one other question, and then I'll, I'll turn to Diane for another one before we wrap up. Uh, so in terms of uh, if you do find them and you pick it up, um, do you have to worry that they'll bite you or sting you if you hold them incorrectly or if you pick them up or anything like that? Not at all. Yeah, they're so fun to handle. Um, I mean, they, they have little tarsal claws, so they kind of stick to you as they walk like a lot of insects do but they're extremely unlikely to hurt you in any way. They don't sting, they don't bite, they really can't do much of anything, they're just gonna crawl on you. So we had a small child at the time when they came out in 2004 and he just loved handling them and playing with them. They're really kid-friendly animals. <laughs> so our, our kids used to sit and watch them on the fence at the bus stop and, and pick them up and move them and have races and you know, do all kinds of things with them. So. Um, is long, and it's a great way to get kids excited, you know, about insects in general, and they're totally, you know, harmless, so. Okay, well, good. I'm, I'm glad you said that because, uh, you know, John and Diane, uh, you know, the other question was, uh, there's probably some children, you know, watching with their families tonight, and, you know, how can you reassure them if, you, you know, they're afraid of the big red eyes, and they're afraid of how they emerge, and uh, other than being safe to handle, you know, what can you share with the, the children that we have here tonight? One thing I wanted to tell you is they look really big and scary in those videos because it's just beautiful videography, but look how little they are. <laughs> They're really cute. And um, if you are a little bit nervous about, you know, touching one or getting too close, just don't worry about it because they're mostly up in the trees. They're not going to be like flying all around in the wide open. So you could just sit outside and close your eyes and listen to the sound and maybe draw what you think that sounds like to you. And if you really want to look at them up close, but you're not quite ready to um, touch a live cicada, Remember, they shed their exoskeletons. We collected all of these, and this is just a shell. It's just the outside part. It's not alive. So you can feel free to pick those up off of the trees and look closely, and maybe that'll be a way for you to, you know, um, get to learn about the cicadas a little bit without being scared. And definitely check out our website, friendtocicadas.org. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to put that in the chat, I'm going to um, access that in just a second. And I just want to say, as we wrap up, thank you so much to John and Diane. If there's any last minute questions, I'm sure they can talk much more <laughs> about it tonight. So uh, if you have anything, please don't be shy about that. Uh, I just want to share my screen, screen just briefly, and uh, I will... Uh, just wrap up and show you some of the, let me just doing two things at once here. So there we go. I just wanted to show uh, some of our upcoming programs just to just let, let you know that we do have a few other things coming up uh, in the spring. And what I wanted to say is that uh, coming up at the end of the month, kind of to continue our outdoor garden environmental education theme, uh, we will be celebrating National Garden Month with a collections conversation, which is an informal discussion that we have with several guest speakers, uh, looking at some of our collection items, our archival materials, our photographs. Uh, and so we'll be talking about Montpelier Mansion, uh, Snow Hill, and the Gardens of Laurel. So we'll be talking about that on April 22nd uh, in the morning at 11. 
Uh, and then next month uh, for our regular spring webinar series, we're going to be talking um, about the Guilford Quarry Cemetery. So kind of a belated celebration for Maryland Archaeology Month, which is actually happening this month in April. Uh, so we'll be talking about some of the historical research and archaeological investigations uh, that have been happening uh, in the Guilford District, uh, which is in, Har uh, in Howard County, uh, just north of us here in Laurel. Uh, and then I just I do want to show you uh, that we do have some walking tours coming up. They are currently waitlisted, uh, but now uh, listening to John and Diane, I'm kind of wondering what we're gonna see maybe coming up or uh, maybe the May uh, walking tour to see how many cicadas will we'll kind of be walking in and around uh, in the historic district. Um, but if you are interested in, please contact us. We do have a waitlist, like I said, and we will be adding additional tour uh, dates coming up in the rest of the spring and summer as well. Uh, and then just a, a quick plug for the museum uh, to support us in various ways. Uh, one of the ways is that you can become a member of our museum. We have various levels of membership from individuals to families, especially if you and your children are listening uh, with us tonight, you can join as a family to support the museum uh, as well as business and um, student memberships as well. And then just finally, also, uh, if you are a member of our organization, thank you so much for your past support. Uh, if you aren't, uh, we suggest that maybe uh, you can uh, send $2 or so our way for uh, support of the virtual programs that we're putting on. And you can find that from our website. And I will put uh, that information into the chat box uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, but this is our contact information here at the Laurel Historical Society. If you have any questions uh, that I can answer, uh, feel free to contact us um, by uh, email or phone and be sure to connect with us also on social media. Uh, that's the best way to find out about some of our upcoming programs uh, and any other activities we have coming up. So I will just stop sharing my screen so I can put all that information into the chat. Um, and if there's any other questions, let me just take a peek. All right, I think- I wish I could see Steven's cicada shirt and cicada <laughs> mode. <laughs> I saw that earlier. We have a, a true a true fan of cicadas. So. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. This is so fun. Uh, and I'm, I'm really glad uh, to know that there's families in the audience listening. Uh, and like you said, I'm really uh, looking forward to it now, and I'm not going to be afraid to uh, kind of walk down the streets of Laurel uh, <laughs> during prime cicada season. So again, thank you so much to John and Diane for being our uh, wonderful speakers here tonight. I'm going to put all that information that I said into the chat box, and, and then if there's any other questions or follow-ups, please feel free uh, to do that with us. And if not, then I'm going to stop the recording and have everyone um, just say have a good night. And thank you so much. Thank you.